meine Damen und Herren. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to resume now the discussion between Ivan Kastic and Sven Gigorg has shown quite nicely that the results of the European elections were quite diverse and can be interpreted in a different way. This is why we would like to go into more detail to analyze if we can see some trends despite these diverse results. What do the election results mean for the different countries? Um, or maybe we can also talk about different regions and their results and what this uh, means for the European uh, policy of these countries. And then we might also be able to talk about um, what uh, it means for Germany in the end. Well, we've already talked about it. It's very difficult to really assess the results uh, or at least assess the results without any contradictions. On the one hand, we have right-wing nationalist parties that became the or won actually in their countries or emerged victorious. And in other countries, they lost. In some countries, the major people's parties uh, declined. In other countries, they achieved good results, and so on and so forth. So the Greens um, achieved uh, many votes in some countries and in other countries or other regions. They lost or are no longer represented. We would now like to focus on the four countries that are represented here on the panel. And we would like to ask whether a European election has actually taken place there, which means have the voters actually voted on Europe or was the focus on national topics? And if they voted on Europe, for which kind of Europe did they vote? And what was the motivation for them? Did they predominantly vote for Eurosceptic parties or for pro-European parties? And here we have a great panel. I would like to welcome Sylvie Trudet from, from Paris. I would also like to welcome Piotr Boras from Warsaw. I would like to welcome Lina Papadopoulou from Greece, um, Thessaloniki in this case. And I'd also like to welcome Uwe Jun from so welcome to the four of you. Uwe, we've known each other for quite some time, so it's not that I forgot your surname. Professor Dr. Uwe Jun is professor for political science at the University of Trier, and amongst others, he also lectured at the Harvard University in Stockholm and in Berlin. We will start with Germany. So here in Germany, we have a trend that was reinforcing, which is that the traditional major parties like CDU and SPD lost ground, and in particular, the Greens were able to actually almost double their result. So how would you assess this result, and what kind of Europe did the voters in Germany vote for? Well, first of all, I think we can say that um, we can have an optimistic view. Never before have the Germans been so pro-European at a European elections in terms of their friendliness towards Europe. So never before have the German voters seen Europe that positive during a European election. And the reason is that uh, we had a high politicization. The um, attitude towards, a positive attitude towards Europe was quite high. And this had an effect on the AFD, which was uh, or is the only one which is Eurosceptic from the Bundestag parties, and they did not achieve the desired result because their main topics did not um, uh, gain so much support by the voters. So 
this is what we can say for Germany. This is a positive or optimistic result. And the second thing that we can say for Germany is that the Greens are usually seen as an antipode for the AfD. And this has also been supported by the AfD itself. And also, this made the Greens seem to be the most pro-European party. And this contributed to the great result of the Greens. However, we also have to say that if we take a look at the post-election uh, surveys, that this was not as important as the climate topics. So climate climate protection was actually much more present with German voters than at the European level as a whole when it comes to um, the decision in favor of the Greens. So the climate protection issue was the most important topic. However, the Greens also benefited from this seemingly pro-European attitude and for being an antipode uh, to the AFD. But what we've also seen is that during this European election trends, which we've seen during this European election, but also during the state elections of the past years, uh, is continuing. So also national topics played a role here. So the trends that we've seen in regional elections in Bavaria and Hesse have continued here, one on one. And the two so-called people's parties, SPD and CDU, uh, lost ground. I think the SPD is about to finally lose their status as a people's party. Um, and that both lost, actually, and the Greens were the biggest winner in both these elections. And this is a trend that we can see here at the European election once again. So the voters did not distinguish that much between a national state parliament and the European parliament. And two weeks ahead of the uh, elections, I was quite astonished that Infratest DMAP had two different graphics. Um, who would you vote for if we had European elections? And who would you vote for if we had uh, German elections? And the difference with the Green Party was the most striking one. But at the end, um, the voters were in favor of the um, mandate for the German parliament and not the European one. And so the SPD also was the biggest loser. At the beginning, they were better at the European level than at the um, German parliamentary election, but um, I think this is um, just a first impression from Germany. But we would like to continue with France. Professor Sylvie Strudel, she's a professor for political science at the University de Paris 2 in Paris, and she's also the director at the Centre d'études constitutionnelles et politiques. And she's also the director of the Master program and many other things. But what is very interesting is that at the Centre Marc Bloch, you did some research and you were also a guest lecturer in Berlin and Stuttgart. So this is why you do not only know the French party landscape, but also the German party landscape. Back to my question. So France is one of those um, Western European countries where a right-wing party emerged victorious from the European elections. And the result for Marine Le Pen was not as high as people feared. But she's still one percentage point ahead of the president's party um, of uh, Emmanuel Macron. And another result is that this trend that the people's parties are losing ground um, can be seen here as well. So the conservatives, the socialists only um, had a result in the one digit um, area. So and um, a surprising result was the result of the French Greens, which uh, are ranked third with more than 13 percent. So my question to you is now, was this a European Election. So did the French voters vote on Europe or did they vote on national topics? Thank you very much, Christine. As you can hear, I my name is Strudel, uh, but I'm not going to answer you in uh, German. And I will switch to English. Answer would be free answers, because I could uh, tell you that this French election was a national election. 
It is also a national election, but not a so pure uh, sogenannte uh, second order national election from the model of uh, Reif and Schmidt. And third, my answer would be uh, that it was also a European election. And so I would try to uh, explain it in a few bullet points. The first answer is, uh, yes, you are right, it was a national election, and I would uh, mention five reasons for that. The first reason is that uh, we had a change of the voter district, and we came back to a national-wide uh, district, so that means that, has, that had a big uh, nationalization influence on the uh, results of the scrutiny. Second, the electoral campaign, with, uh, which was like, a, um, I would say, a battle or a clash between uh, Macron, LRM, and uh, Fr uh, Front National um, movement of Marine Le Pen, uh, was in a campaign uh, that turned in a sort of only third round of the French uh, presidential campaign or on the fifth one, if you just count, for example, the legislative uh, election. The first reason is that uh, nobody took care at both of the head of the lists, uh, either from uh, Rassemblement National or from the uh, LRM, uh, because uh, Jordan Bardella was a very young, very, very young um, uh, list um, head uh, with uh, 23 years old, but he was very expect, expect, um, no, effective, sorry. And Nathalie Loiseau was also very expert, but uh, that uh, she had not one gram of uh, charism. And so all the campaign was in an extreme personalization uh, inflamed by the two leaders uh, of the, par the so-called parties, um, Macron and uh, Le Pen themselves. The fourth reason to be um, a very nationalized election is that in the battle, um, and it is uh, opposite of what you heard in the commentaries of political leaders and also of the media, RN uh, was in the lead, but just of one uh, point, m less than one point before Macron. And this was um, uh, the result that at the end, the both of the parties are going to gain the same number of seats at the European Parliament. The only thing you have to point, it's the fifth reason of a nationalization, and uh, it is, uh, as you mentioned it, the very bad result for the two traditional parties in France, the Parti Socialiste and Les Républicains, because it totals together less than 15%. So you understand the situation, maybe for both of them. So in sum, we can say that in this election, the French election, you have nationalization and also a big uh, personalization of the scrutiny, and that means that you are um, uh, finding again the two pillars of the Fifth Republic, and also you have the third one about polarization, but now it is a new polarization that appears, uh, and it is the same as for the presidential election uh, in 2017. That was my first answer. <laughs> if I may continue, there is a second answer to say that this election was not a so pure uh, second order election because we had four big surprises for this uh, ballot. The first one is the strong as you mentioned, and as we mentioned before, increase in voter turnout. The second one is the absence of sanction vote against the government despite a perfect midterm calendar in France for this ballot. The first uh, surprise is no rise of protest parties and even less of the yellow vest. Maybe we can come back to this point uh, in the debate uh, after. The fourth surprise in this election is the good news that, uh, and this is more in line with the um, traditional results of a second order election, it is the very good results of the green post-materialist party in France with 13.5%. Uh, and we have a five surprise uh, since yesterday evening. It is um, uh, the way of um, 
uh, Laurent Vauquier resignated from the head of the Republican. So you, you know this kind of story because you have the same as Germany. So uh, we have, that means what is important to know and to notice is only that here, European elections have effects on national political life, and this is not such uh, in the mood and, uh, and the tendency of a national uh, second order election. And so I arrive to my third answer to your question. And it is natural, um, it is uh, the answer about uh, the Europeanization of this election. So not so national, but national, not so second order election, but a little bit, and very much Europeanized. I have three, four points, no four, sorry. The first one is the rise of the participation. But as many commentators said in France, um, it is not a proof, I don't think so, and I'm sure of that, um, a proof of love from EU lovers, but it is only uh, a, a sign for politicization. Uh, that means that pro and anti-EU EU were mobilized, as you mentioned, and it is the same in France. And it is very clear when you look at the data, you can see that you have this polarization and this mobilization from the electors of the both sides. The second point is the clash. I mentioned before the clash be between La, Re uh, La Rem and uh, Le Front National. What you can see now here on this clash, it is a Euro clash, I would say, uh, Nell Flickstein. Why? Because this means that the election in France was clearly about the European issue between Eurosceptics from the FN and Europartisans uh, from the République uh, En Marche. And so it is a very, point, a very important point to notice that uh, there are three winners in this election, not two, but three. And the three are La République En Marche, Le Front National, and also the Greens. And why is it important? Because that explains, maybe, that they are winning because they have very clear position about the European issue. And you could maybe explain the collapse of the other parties, the traditional parties, PS and also Les Républicains, because they have a very, uh, uh, how would you say that, yin discourse uh, permanently about the European question and also practicing what we call a politics of muffling about this question of Europe. More hysteric Interestingly, it's uh, my fourth um, and last point about uh, this question is that um, I mentioned we have three winners. And uh, this learns us, I think, something about uh, what could be the new cleavage in Europe and in France about Europe. That means that um, uh, the direction of this cleavage is not only binary, that means uh, an opposition between uh, uh, the winners and the losers, I said, uh, as um, uh, Hans-Peter Krisi is uh, mentioning, order, um, an opposition between uh, pro and anti-European, uh, or as Macron framed the campaign between uh, nationalists and progressists. But I think that the, this new cleavage about EU is more uh, bi bi bidimensional. I don't know. <laughs> uh, bi okay, thank you very much. Bidimensional, um, that means uh, first about pro and anti-Europe, and second, and second, this is very important, about pro-left or pro-right uh, orientation and political uh, um, uh, experiences of the, of the voters. It means, um, if I say it just uh, in other terms, that uh, the people will um, hope that about Europe, they are not not only for Europe or against Europe, but they are waiting for specific politics, just left-oriented or right-oriented. And here comes back the green and the success of the green in France, because I think that explains 
that it was a possibility to just get out from the alternative. They were blocked, we were blocked uh, during this campaign from Macron and Marine Le Pen and the Greens. This was a success of people who just wanted pro-Europe, but from the left side. And so it's bidimensional. Thank you very much. Before we, uh, to pull Before we uh, take a look at Poland, I would like to ask a question to the two of you. So we, you said that the three winners uh, are the three parties that gained the most votes, which is the Front National, Rassemble National, uh, from Le Pen, Macron's party, and also the Greens. And you said that they had a clear cut position when it comes to Europe. OK. And the question was, what kind of Europe did the French voters vote for? And I would like to add a question or raise a follow-up question, which is directed at the um, right-wing parties, the Front National and in Germany, the AFD. So both are not really championing uh, an exit from the EU. And Ivan Krasnitz has also mentioned that no party at the moment, no party that is represented in the European Parliament explicitly calls for an exit of their own country from the EU. And the AFD actually uh, dropped this question shortly before the elections from the Valomat um, because they noticed that um, this is not really helping them succeed. So what is still Eurosceptic or hostile towards Europe um, in these two parties? Well, Matteo Salvini demanded it. He said, well, we want to change Europe from within and not from the outside. And many of these parties are actually subscribing to it. Also the AFD, who have de uh, set up a similar strategy now. However, they are clearly uh, trying to achieve a different kind of Europe, diverting competencies away from the EU level back to the nation state level, and that the European institutions should lose power. That's what they are striving for. This is what they want to see as an end result. So no more integration, but they call it Europe of the fatherland. So this is actually their strategy <clears throat> in order to achieve this kind of national sovereignty and to push back on the European um, identity. So how did they um, convince the voters in, in Europe and uh, in Germany? Sorry. Um, so obviously uh, the AFD objectives did not really convince the voters. So if you only take a look at the European elections, a large number of people in Germany said, well, the advantages of Europe are outweighing the disadvantages. So the Germans see more advantages than disadvantages when it comes to Europe. And the AFD is reacting to it. Also, other right-wing populists are reacting to it by acknowledging it and saying, OK, um, it would be against the mainstream to say that uh, Europe is a thing of the devil, devilish. Um, so if people think that the benefits are outweighing the disadvantages, then we also have to make it part of our narrative. However, a very important thing is, and I would agree to Sven Giegold in that, was not only the ecological question, but the Greens were able to defend this pro-European idea, and they are also able to implement it according to the voters. And this is what the voters do not see in the two other governing parties. So those who were in favor of Europe right from the outset did not vote for the traditional parties in Germany because they are not that clear in terms of their uh, to, uh, policies towards Europe. Even though they proclaim a pro-European attitude towards the outside, it's um, difficult for them to implement it. And the voters recognize that. And this is why the extreme pro-European voters um, voted for the Greens. In particular, in the urban centers, we could see it in the map, the east was 
colors blue, light blue. It was the AFD. I don't know why they, their color is blue. Um, the West was black, so conservative, traditional conservatives. And then there were green dots, green dots where we had universities, cities, and where Wherever we have universities, wherever we have academics, the pro-European idea is most strongly represented. Thank you very much. Same question to you, to France. Thank you. Uh, my answer would be uh, very, uh, I hope so, pre precise when saying that the, uh, the answer of the Front National was an ambiguity, and they still are in an ambiguity discourse, but they just listen what happened uh, for the presidential campaign, and uh, at that moment uh, they lost uh, a lot because of their position against uh, Europe and uh, against the EU, um, the Euro. And so just they, they changed uh, not their mind, but their discourse. And we are going to see what's going on, but I think we, we have to listen to this um, um, possibility for them to, um, to maybe have an, another direction. And this is also um, a sign of normalization, I would say, about all the extreme right, and not only for uh, the French ones, because uh, uh, they just um, made as if they would abandon their Exit discourse. Yeah. Okay, vielen Dank. Wir gehen jetzt nach Polen mit Piotr Buras. Er ist Direktor des Warschauer Büro. Okay, now to Poland with Piotr Buras. He is the head of the Warsaw Office, European Council of Foreign Relations. So we have a very trans European panel here. All of you worked in other European countries for a very long time. He worked as a Berlin correspondent and a guest professor at the foundation. Piotr, in Poland, the situation is somewhat different. Here, the governing peace party had a very good result of 45%. And I, we have to highlight it. On the one hand, right-wing parties are elected, gain a majority, and sometimes they are re-elected, confirmed, legitimized. And this was the case for peace, though it was a European election. On the other hand, the broad pro-European coalition also achieved almost 40% of the vote, which is also reason for hope. So my question, how do you interpret the election results in Poland? And could it be said that it was a vote on Europe? And if so, for what kind of Europe? Thank you, Christiane. You asked the question whether we can see some trends in Europe for all EU member states. If we look for a common denominator in the European elections, then Poland uh, is a kind of dead end. Poland is an exception with regard to the election results for two reasons. And this relates to your question whether it was a European or a national election and also to the final result. Was it a European election? Well, superficially speaking, it was a European European election because the opposition called itself European coalition. So the name already spread the message. It's about Europe. It's whether we vote for or against Europe. And I will come to this. But I think this positioning 
or the fact that the election was made a fateful election for Europe also explains the final result because it just didn't work out. This strategy didn't work out that it became uh, such a vote. But Poland is also an exception in Europe because of the enormous polarization at the political level. This is interesting. Ivan and Sven Giegold spoke about it. The uh, characteristic of the political situation or the political situation is characterized by fragmentation. So the common denominator is the fragmentation of the party landscape, a weakening of the catch-all parties. In Poland, the situation is completely different. We have an even bigger polarization. We speak about polarization in France, where the two winners of the election did not even get 50% of the vote together. In Poland, uh, peace achieved 45% of the votes, the coalition 38, and then some smaller parties. There's only one that could get across the 5% hurdle. So my first point is Poland is an exception. And it goes in a completely different political direction, a bit similar to America. Two nations within one state. My second point as to the election success of peace. Peace gained 45% of the vote the best result ever since 1989. No single party in a national election or in a European election achieved such a result. Peace, and this may be even more important for forecasting the future compared to the last parliamentary election where the, this party conquered power successfully and has been governing Poland since 2015, compared to the 2015 election peace, won another 500,000 voters, while the whole opposition taken together lost one million of voters in a situation where the uh, this election was not a European election because European issues didn't play a role in the election campaign. Actually, it was a kind of foreplay for the fateful election coming up this autumn, the uh, parliamentary election that is already considered the most important election in Poland since 1989. Given this great polarization, we have arrived at a situation where the governing party gets 500,000 new voters and the opposition loses 1 million voters. I think this is quite remarkable. What were the reasons for the success of peace? Two very obvious reasons. Uh, first, there is not a mood for change in Poland, different from what the opposition used to say was the only thing that counts is to oust peace from power. And this should not come, this is not true, and this should not come as a surprise because the economic situation is really good. 
we have uh, an unemployment lower than ever. We have a very good economic situation, good data. And the second point is that the governing party delivered on its promises of 2015, especially in the social political field. And when we made the survey mentioned by Ivan Krastev, we found that the peace voters are very satisfied with the situation in Poland, with the political situation they are very optimistic, much more optimistic than the voters of the other party. So they have become part of the establishment. It should not be a surprise that peace could consolidate its voter basis. The voters uh, continued to support peace, but also new voters were won. Why were they won? Peace managed in an election that uh, was only about the mobilization of one's own voters to mobilize these voters. So also the peace voters in the countryside participated in the elections. Other voters did it too, but to a much lesser extent. And peace also made different promises, new family policy measures, new pension payments, etc. And uh, it also controlled the state, state media, the state TV, so the whole propaganda machine uh, supported peace. And my last point is that this election is also a remarkable defeat of the opposition. So it's not only a victory of the governing party, but also a defeat of the opposition that formed a very broad coalition from left to right. But this large coalition did not present a real alternative. It was rather incoherent, and also the election campaign was rather poor. And they called the election campaign as a zero-sum game, saying peace wants to take Poland out of the EU which the voters just didn't accept. And the lack of a real political alternative, a vision for the country was probably the most important problem and the most important reason for the opposition to garner more votes than uh, just the votes of the different members of the parties that, that formed the coalition. I have another question. I heard you say that the confirmation of peace had mainly domestic motivation, so social political promises were capped, the economic situation. For many Germans, it's difficult to understand what peace represents. It's not a member of EPP, but it's also not in the group of uh, Salvini. It is in a group with the conservatives. 
Could you say something about the ideas about Europe of peace? In Poland, they obtain high values. They support EU membership and see the advantages Poland has uh, from EU membership. Nevertheless, the voters vote for a party that is Eurosceptical. Uh, for what kind of Europe does peace stand? What we heard about the AFD and the uh, uh, Europe program uh, also fits peace. It's a party that does not question Poland's EU membership, but wants to have a somewhat different EU, especially when it comes to the sovereignty rights of the member states, the role of national parliaments. So it's a bit a kind of mixture from AFD and Tory, so the competencies of supranational bodies should be reduced. The question is, how can this be done? And what would be the concrete consequences? Perhaps it is intended to mean that majority votes are limited. So an extension of majority votes is rejected. They will not agree to this. But looking at the latest publications, for instance, a policy article of the prime minister published a couple of days ago, then we see a lot of mainstream thinking about four-fifths of the text could also have come from an EPP politicians, but this is also in contradiction uh, what the party uh, does in Poland. So it is a double track strategy where the EU is sometimes criticized as a fictitious community with ideological elements. But at the European level, there are also uh, some common points with the thinking of the mainstream parties. The biggest differences relate to the question of sovereignty and the independency of the member states. For instance, when it comes to the single market, the party uh, presents itself as very liberal, market-friendly. So it is a mix mixture of market liberalism and ideological conservatism supplemented by the uh, sovereignty logic. Thank you. As to the attitude of Poland toward the sanctions, when, when it comes to rule of law, we will come in a minute. Now we go to Greece, Professor Dr. Lina Popadopoulou. She is professor for constitutional law at the university in Thessaloniki. And she also held the chair of European constitutional law. Welcome. My question about Greece. The uh, governing party, Syriza, lost many votes and announced already new elections. 
uh, both with regard to the last EU election and uh, national election, the uh, new democracy party got about uh, more than 33 percent. My question was it a uh, election about Europe or did national issues dominate? And if it was a European election for what? I'm going to answer in English. Election. It was something like a midterm election, I would say, because we will have elections this year. We would have it anyway. Uh, the latest in uh, late September or uh, beginning of October. But now, as you said, after the election result, our prime minister declared that he would go to the, to the president of the republic and to ask for elections. Well, maybe he will think about it again. He is known for his kolotumbas. So some journalists say that uh, he still thinks about it. But um, it, was, um, uh, some, it, it was a winning for um, Nea Demokratia, New Democracy, the right wing, the Conservative Party, who belongs to the EPP, the European People's Party, and his leader, um, Kyriakos Mitsotakis. He was considered to be also a um, personal uh, uh, winning result uh, because he had to face also a lot of opposition within its, his own party, New Democracy, because a fraction of it... Um, supports in a way or another um, the Syriza party. Uh, so the, the whole election had very much uh, this character of mid-term elections and everybody wanted to prove that they are still uh, strong in the society and they can win the uh, upcoming national elections. Um, so if we... Uh, needs to uh, reply to the question what kind of, a, of Europe uh, did Greek uh, voters vote for. Uh, we can distinguish the openly, uh, uh, not only skeptical, but um, against Europe parties, which are the Orthodox Communist Party and the Golden Doe, the neo-Nazi neo party. They are um, openly against the European Union in favor of a, of a Brexit and uh, dissolvement of the union altogether. Um, and uh, this time, the Golden Toe lost uh, something like half of its uh, voters because uh, some of them preferred another right-wing uh, candidate. Um, you spoke about comic people going to the European Parliament. Uh, now we also have um, one of them, Velopoulos. He is a right-wing, ultra-right-wing, but a light Nazi. He said, I don't like heavy Nazism, but... Light, that's, it's okay. And he was a, a person who, on TV, he had a show and sold. He used to sell uh, letters handwritten by Jesus Christ. Okay? So we have um, open dialogue with um, God himself. He was... Um, <laughs> Elected, he has been elected, uh, and uh, actually he was the reason why the Golden Dawn actually lost a lot of uh, uh, its voters because they're the heavy Nazis. There, apart from them, all the other parties more or less are in favor of Europe. I say more or less because um, one cannot exactly be very sure about Syriza. We know uh, Syriza, you know Syriza, you have heard about Syriza. We know that Tsipras was for another Europe. Uh, you said before that if somebody says, I am for another Europe, for a different Europe, maybe he's not exactly in favor of Europe. But we know exactly, um, we rem maybe you also remember the infamous phrase, go back, Madame Merkel, but then Tsipras became one of the closest friends of Madame Merkel. So um, we don't exactly know how Syriza will behave. He, uh, the Syriza party belongs to the uh, party of European left, but he said he's going to support Timmermans for president of the uh, commission. So um, they are transforming themselves in different ways. You cannot exactly place them. Uh, I tend to, to say that they are the populists par excellence, and I'm saying par excellence because I try to think, I, I, I tend to think that what we call right-wing populist parties, they're not, after all, populist, they're more right-wing than populist. I mean, I think that uh, those parties, uh, maybe it's a, a euphemism to call them only populist, they're rather really right-wing illiberal parties, but I think Syriza is a par excellence populist party. 
um, meaning that the whole election, uh, electoral campaign was based on the slogan, we are for the many and against the elites, which is how we actually describe populists. So all the election campaign is we are for the people, we are for the many, and not for the elite, not for the few, despite the fact that they actually gained less votes than um, this, uh, the Conservative Party. Uh, there is also another uh, Greek exceptionalism uh, there, which has to do with uh, the uh, almost evaporation of the Social Democrats. They uh, gained uh, two seats. Um, they had two seats, the PASOK uh, party. Uh, the Socialist Party, but uh, with a very low percentage, that's uh, around 8%, you can, you can see it there. Uh, so we don't have a Social Democratic Party anymore, but a very small one, the party who used to, to govern in Greece for many years, as you know. And the other uh, national um, uh, difference, or the national exceptionalism, is that we don't have any Liberal Party elected uh, in the European Parliament, uh, neither a Green Party. Uh, the Liberals, uh, the, peop the party who was with Macron, is called uh, the River, Topotami. It's uh, something, let's say, uh, Lib, uh, Lib Dem, I would say, or something like that. They couldn't make it because we have the 3% hurdle, so they didn't pass the 3%, they had less than that. And uh, the Greens, they were split in three pieces, and none of them got enough votes to, to get, but they are not really a considerable um, a political power in Greece. So uh, we have these strains. You, you, you also spoke about fragmentation, and um, Ivan Krastev also spoke about national idiosyncrasy, etc. So we do have something like a Greek exceptionalism there with new democracy being the most um, normal party, let's say, normal for the EPP, I, I mean. They belong there and they don't have any problems. Um, with Syriza playing around between um, uh, populism and trying to become or wanting to, to show that it tries to become Social Democratic Party, but it's far away from, uh, from going there because they can't beat their own B DNA, I would say. Um, social Democrats almost extinguished, and no Greens, no Liberals. Um, uh, Greeks are less than in the past in favor of Europe because uh, of the crisis and all the measures, the austerity measures taken, but they are still in, uh, uh, in favor of them in, in majority, although less than in the, uh, in the past. Um, I think these are the most important facts okay. to Thank you, Nina. Um, ich würde jetzt gerne noch eine I would like to have another round on the future of European policies in your countries. In Germany, it was said before, the Greens now demand from the German government to give up its passive attitude in European policies and to pursue a sustainable European policy. And we wrote an analysis about Germany as a paymaster for the EU. It's obvious that the German government has rejected any reform ideas from France, etc., uh, with the argument that the burden on the German taxpayer should not be continued. So uh, it often it is seen as a cost factor, not as a shaping factor. My question, will this now change after the elections because of more pressure by the Greens? Of course, it also depends whether the Grand Coalition will uh, continue. And for France, Macron is probably weakened by the election, or is he strengthened? He will be weakened because uh, Front National has become the strongest power. He could be uh, strengthened because it was not such disastrous 
in Poland, peace is now in a more solid position. And for Greece, we, you do not know what the new elections will bring. I would be very grateful to you if you could point out a trend. What do you think? What uh, is the impact for the future European policies of your countries? Let me start with Greece. said before, I mean, we are going to have uh, elections um, either in one month or the latest uh, beginning of October. And um, everybody foresees a change in government that the new democracy, the conservative the right wing party or center right wing party will come into power. Um, so I think um, Mitsotakis as a prime minister, he will be totally in line with uh, what will be decided uh, in Brussels. And uh, the European Parliament has a majority of the EPP, so he belongs to the EPP. He was on one of them who actually forced um, the EPP against Orban. He didn't want to um, be equated with Orban because there was a slogan at home and Tsipras said, well, Mitsotakis is the Greek Orban. So he wanted to actually show that he's against Orban, that he doesn't have anything with these um, uh, ultra-right uh, wing uh, parties. Uh, so I think he will just be um, in line with Brussels. Uh, sorry, this is actually the time that I should go uh, to school to pick up my, uh, my boy. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and I, I forgot to turn my... Uh, I'm, I'm re I really apologize about that. Um, so um, I think um, with the new government, there shouldn't be a problem. Uh, what we don't know, as I said before, is actually how Syriza will react if they go back to opposition. This is something that uh, everybody places a question mark. Uh, will, he be ve uh, will Syriza behave in the way he used to, be to behave before becoming a government, which means against, again throwing stones, let's say, in, um, or, or it will try to transform itself into a social democratic party and try to uh, actually respect uh, the procedures of, uh, uh, of a parliamentary democracy. That's, that's a question mark. We, we don't exactly know how they will uh, decide to, to behave. We will continue with Piotr. The question also is, what are the expectations towards Germany in this regard? Well, um, as regards Poland, um, I mean, Germany is a very important uh, benchmark, a very important um, country for us. So I think that the uh, European policies will be determined much more, though, by other things over the next years, irrespective of who is going to win the national elections in the fall. I'm a bit skeptical when it comes to a political change in Poland, um, also in view of the recent European parliamentary uh, election results. But in terms of European policies, we in Poland have a more important problem. And I can give you a very good example. For example, if we now think about the major issues of in European politics or the European Union um, uh, over the next years, what will actually characterize or mark the European uh, Union? Of course, we could name a lot, um, but I would say that it is this um, um, this discussion between the US and the EU or the, the, the quarrels here. And the second big thing is how does Europe react to its relative decline and also the competition with major or against major powers like China, also major corporations or other uh, major partners like the US. And the third big topic is the climate policy. And the fourth big topic is democracy. So how do we uh, 
defend ourselves against the attacks on democracy from within and from outside. So if we take a look at all four topics, we can see that Poland is not in line with these strategic developments in the European Union. We can even go as far and say that from the point of view of the current definition of the Polish national interests, the European Union is actually going into a wrong direction. And the question is, is it correct? Is this right? Is this true? If Europe, for example, would uh, incorporate or implement protectionist protectionist measures against Chinese corporations or Chinese actors, then this will also change the functioning of the single market in Europe. And this actually contradicts the Polish interests of an open market and of a liberal market. Uh, as regards the US, um, we want to close ranks here with Washington. And this is not exactly what the direction of the overall EU is. And we have a problem with the climate policy as well, because it is going to kill our coal um, industry, uh, fossil fuel industry. And of course, um, we know that um, it will be more and more important at the European level. And this would, will be the strategic dilemma for Poland over the next years. And even if we had a different government, then the new government will have to face up to the same question, maybe not the question of democracy, because this um, will eventually be solved with a new government. But um, this um, will all in all be more important than anything that we uh, that we see from the Polish point of view in terms of Europe. Thank you very much. Who is reinforced and not? Um, many reasons for that. First, he is reinforced because he gained uh, with, um, as I mentioned before, with the Front National, uh, Rassemblement National, just at the, with a difference of one point. So, uh, this is nothing, and this is nothing also because he he could um, realize what he wanted is that to put the Les Républicains, that means uh, the right party, traditional party, into a kind of uh, <laughs> nutcracker between le, um, La République en Marche, his party, and the Front National, and so this very traditional party has. Uh, lose some more and more space from the presidential election. This is the first reason uh, why maybe uh, I could say that he is reinforced. The second reason is that uh, he is in a central position as he was for the presidential election. That means he could... Um, speak from this en même temps, you know, maybe about uh, uh, he is from the right and he is from the left. But he is not reinforced because this is not as true as um, you could think. What is not true is that he gained the election because he obtained a lot of the voices from the left. That means from the Hollande, the former Hollande um, voters for the election. And now the uh, electorate of Macron, it is the same, quite the same as in the presidential election. That means there are two point differences, just um, minus uh, two points. But it is not the same electorate, because now he lose a large part of his electorate, but gained uh, an electorate from Les Républicains and the former electors from Fillon. And this is very important to understand, because uh, Macron is the same and not the same as he was two years before. And this is going to have um, different consequences on the politics. Yeah, interesting. Uh, well, it's interesting whether the uh, European attitude or the, the European pol policy attitude of Macron will change um, in the future, but still we um, have heard um, the many proposals of, of France and the 
German government has not yet declined everything. We conducted a survey which shows quite clearly that the a large majority of the Germans is in favor or taking more money together with other European partners in order to uh, design a sustainable European policy in the future and that they also wish for a more active and um, proactive um, policy towards Europe. So the question is, is this uh, election result a mandate um, for Germany to become more active and to devise a more active uh, policy towards Europe? Well, first of all, we have to say that in Germany we are in a transition period and we do not know how long this transition phase will take. Even when this uh, grand coalition was renewed, we clearly knew that it was going to be the last one. And only Steinmeier and Lindner were the decisive personalities here. If uh, it wasn't for them, then we wouldn't have this grand coalition. So we do not know how long this transition period will take. And we have to add that Merkel was never the big EU enthusiast. She never had any visions for Europe, even in the phase when it was about support for Greece. She was hesitating for a long time whether we should do anything at all, and only after a long period of time she knew what to do, say, actually, what to do. Uh, she uh, is a, a power politician, and I think she w would have preferred if we uh, um, could have or would have been able to postpone everything. And of course, the um, European elections are not decisive from her point of view. She will say that other aspects were more important here in these elections. And and also, uh, Ms. Nahles wasn't a um, staunch Europe enthusiast. We will have to wait and see whether there will be other personnel in the SPD that can relaunch this uh, topic once again. We do not know yet who's going to um, come or lead the SPD in the future and whether that person will be able to relaunch this European idea. But Ms. Merkel would have to be forced to go into that direction. She will herself not um, take initiative here. And what she achieved in Meseberg together with Macron was actually the best she could do. I think she will not go beyond what was agreed upon there. So I think we'll have to wait and see for after the time, for the time after the transition. I don't think that there will be a major change in the European policy um, before that end of the transition period. Thank you very much. I think we still have 10 to 15 minutes left to answer a few questions and to gather a few comments from the audience. And we'll start right away. Here, the lady and Jakob. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, ask the international guests and also the uh, two first panelists, um, what do we have to expect? Uh, I was astonished that this was not brought up um, in the very important migration and asylum policy. What do we have to expect from the new European Parliament? More conflicts, more fortress Europe, or what uh, are we supposed to expect from the new Parliament? Yannicka Brammens, Hertha School of Governance. I wanted to uh, ask Piotr Burat, so how do you assess the result of Vyosna? So why was it that uh, extraordinarily good? Well, I would like to uh, hear one more question. Thank you very much. I've got two questions. My first question is to Mr. Boas. So why were you talking about America when you were actually uh, um, talking about the US? America is a huge continent. And secondly, to Ms. Putz, your final question to the panelists was whether this election result was actually a signal for the fact that Germany would actually uh, start moving in order to um, um, implement a more active European policy. From my point of view, the Federal Republic of Germany has, since uh, the inception of the European Union, has had a very active European policy. And this is why we in Germany 
have so many Polish workers, Romanian workers and others who are competing with the German workers. And this is why we have such a strong election result of the AFD in Eastern Germany. So this is just meant to be a remark maybe to you. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, then we'll pass the floor to Piotr, and you will have to leave on time, I guess. Thank you very much. Just very briefly with America, I'd like to apologize for my uh, imprecision. Of course, I was talking about the United States of America. And the second uh, question, um, referring to Vyosna, I would I think not everybody knows it. It's a new liberal uh, group in Poland with huge ambitions. And Robert Piotr, the party uh, chairman, uh, wanted to achieve a two-digit result in the election. and. He uh, achieved uh, more than 6%, which is really a def major defeat for him. Uh, but I think that there are different reasons for it. The enormous polarization that was forecasted and that also that's also present um, had an impact here. So many voters decided to not vote for a new and much smaller party. So this election was an election in favor or against the government in Poland. And the power of this symbol of the huge opposition block to block to which the Wiosna party did not want to uh, belong would have had some um, importance for the elections in the fall. But I think that I didn't have enough time right now, and it's not the right place in order to go into more detail here. Um, I think that the party also made a few mistakes, and they weren't 100% um, convincing in their positions. And of course, it might also be interesting for you whether the party can assert itself in the political arena in Poland or whether it will become part of the major opposition bloc or disappear altogether. I think this is all still in flux and everything is possible. Well, if you allow me, I would like to give a brief answer to the question uh, on the migration issue. I think the European Parliament will play a certain role here with resolutions, with statements. But if we are able to make progress in the EU in terms of asylum and migration policy in the EU, then this progress will only be achieved on the intergovernmental level. So we cannot expect a major solution where the European Commission and the European Parliament are at the forefront um, uh, and play a major role here, I think we will not see that. Maybe a group of, mem of different member states will come together and, of course, then we will have to wait and see what Germany's position will be. Germany will be dis a decisive factor in that. And only thus we'll be able to, to achieve something here. Thank you very much, Piotr. Well, I um, think that um, this is part of the problem that uh, many Germans, and I do respect your opinion, of course, but uh, my view on that is that uh, we in Germany have the impression and this is due to a certain tradition, however, it is um, um, looking towards the past, actually, that we do a lot for Europe, that we send a lot of money to Europe, that we have a very active um, European policy. But um, it's a little bit um, like when you get old but still think that you're young. So the time is simply over from my point of view. So Germany does not 
uh, have an active European policy, and in particular, the EU is described in a way that Germany uh, would only pay for it and not getting anything out of it. This is a completely wrong image. So you were talking about the work and this is also part of the um, single market in Europe. And Germany is benefiting like no other country from this single market as the biggest exporting country. This is the other side of this image. So this is why it's one of our wishes that Germany would show a more active European policy. Well, thank you very much, Piotr. You have to leave. And... At this point, we will stop. The topic of EU and migration policy will be dealt with in the next panel. Uh, I'm sure of that because then we will talk about the capabilities to act of the EU in the future and what are the most important topics and projects that are coming up and what needs to be done at the European level right now. So first, we will have a break and ho hopefully get some fresh air and we will meet again at 530